Well, good morning to you and sabah I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and I want to thank Ambassador Jones in particular for his introduction and for the hospitality of the embassy while we've been in Iraq. It is good to be back in Baghdad and to be joined here with my deputy envoy and ambassador and longtime friend to Iraq, Ambassador Brett McGurk. And I doubt, frankly, that there's anyone in the U.S. who knows Iraq better than he does in our government. And I'm always grateful for his insight and for his guidance. Now, since my visit to Baghdad three months ago, I've traveled to 15 other capitals. And on each of these visits, our global coalition to counter Daesh grows stronger, as does our collective commitment to the people of Iraq and to the country of Iraq. Among my recent travels, our first uh, our first trip to Baghdad stands out in my mind not simply because of the historic significance of this city or because it was my first trip overseas serving as the President's Special Envoy. It was what I remembered most vividly from that day were the words of Prime Minister Dr. Haider al-Abadi, Daesh's defeat did not depend solely on military success, the Prime Minister told us, but it depended on delivering security reform, advancing national reconciliation, and revitalizing Iraq's ties with its neighbors. These were the efforts that would make success on the battlefield possible, he told us, but it also would set Iraq on the road to recovery an Iraq that would be whole and complete, an Iraq at peace with its neighbors, an Iraq for all Iraqis. On that day, we knew Prime Minister Abadi was a man of vision. And we clearly today see he is a man of action. Already, Prime Minister Abadi has taken several steps to professionalize and to modernize Iraq's security forces. <clears throat> He's made important and timely personnel changes. Iraq's government has worked simultaneously to begin arming and training tribal fighters and to integrate these forces and other irregular elements into Iraq's security forces. And as Iraq's government has become more representative, the nation is becoming more integrated within its region and closer to its neighbors. We arrived here from Riyadh, where Saudi leaders recently announced plans to build an embassy in Iraq, their first in more than a quarter of a century. Iraqi ministers have been and have participated in very productive visits to Ankara, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, Amman, and in turn, we see these governments deepening and broadening their partnership with Iraq. Two days ago, Prime Minister Abadi and key cabinet members, including Defense Minister Obaidi, Oil Minister Abdamadi, completed a two-day visit to Cairo. This is a perfect example of the outreach of the Abadi government to its neighbors and significant partners. Now that more than 60 nations have come together to join the global coalition to counter ISIL, Iraq can count on the support of a host of strong partners from across the world. Each has made significant investments of national prestige and resources in this nation's future. Iraq's coalition partners are providing far more than military support. They're taking leading roles to stop the flow of foreign fighters, to limit Daesh's financing, to provide humanitarian aid and assistance to its victims, and to defeat Daesh where they can do incredible harm, and that is in the virtual space and the marketplace of ideas. Nations as diverse as Morocco and Germany and Kuwait are helping to steer these efforts. On the military side of the equation, 
12 nations of the coalition have committed to train Iraq's security forces at several locations across Iraq, an effort that is now well underway. And eight coalition partners are also participating in airstrikes over Iraq, coordinating their support with our Iraqi partners on the ground for maximum impact. Yesterday, I visited Al-Assad in the Al-Anbar province to see firsthand the progress of our cooperation with the 7th Iraqi Division and the tribal elements on developing security strategies, mission planning support, sharing information and intelligence, and coordinating close air support. Also at Anbar, I received a briefing from the Iraqi security forces on their training and advising of local tribal forces, and I was briefed by one of the province's tribal leaders. On Monday, I visited Erbil, and I met with Kurdish leaders, and we noted the tremendous efforts exerted in the north to defeat Daesh, but also I noted the close coordination between the forces in the north and those of the coalition and with the Iraqi security forces. As Iraq's government has taken critical steps towards reform, the United States has stepped up our support for Iraq's security forces. Last week, and in response to requests from Iraq's government, the United States delivered 250 mine-resistant armor-protected vehicles. This will significantly contribute to the mobility of Iraqi forces and to protect our precious Iraqi allies in their military operations. This contribution was also followed or done in, con in conjunction with a $500 million investment in small arms and ammunition, which was delivered last year. And our government has appropriated $1.6 billion in December to train and equip Iraq security forces for the future. The size of the contributions from the United States and our coalition partners reflects the scope of the challenge that we face. Whether it comes to standing up the Iraqi security forces or standing up to extremist bigotry, these efforts require patience. And even as we make important progress, the future of Iraq is beginning to unfold in a positive way. We must ensure that when the pivotal battles to defeat Daesh in Iraq are joined, the weight of this counteroffensive will be so relenting and so unremitting that Daesh simply cannot endure it. The Iraqis will prevail in this fight. I have seen, personally, I have seen how Iraqi soldiers, courageous men, perform in battle. I've worked with them shoulder to shoulder in combat, and with tribal fighters in Al-Anbar. We watched as they wrested that province from the grip of Al-Qaeda just several years ago. And I've seen how fiercely Iraqis will fight for their country, will fight for their children, will fight for their families, and now will fight for their future. Of course, as we saw so tragically in Paris last week, Iraq is on the front lines of a global conflict. I was in Paris last week meeting with French and European counterparts as the crisis there was unfolding. And it was a stark reminder that Daesh's dark, violent ideology has a long reach. Even before Paris, we saw terrorists inspired by Daesh wreak havoc in other capitals of the coalition, in Sydney and in Ottawa and in Brussels. So none of us can afford to say that degrading and defeating Daesh is solely an Iraqi responsibility. Daesh is a global threat that demands a global response. And that is why the world is coming together to support the brave Iraqis on the front lines of fighting this terrible enemy. Shukran Jazeelat. One moment. I'm 
sorry. Shukran. Uh, we are, I, you said weapons being dropped uh, over ISIL areas. Uh, we are dropping weapons all over ISIL areas and they're dropping them on ISIL. Uh, we're, the, the story, I think, is that we're supplying ISIL. And that, in fact, is not correct. We are not supplying ISIL. Uh, and I think your question also uh, went to whether the coalition will directly support the tribes. Is that correct? That's my question back to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, the, the coalition will not directly arm the Sunni tribes. We are working very closely with the Iraqi uh, government, uh, the Minister of Defense, uh, and the Iraqi security forces uh, for them to work with tribal fighters, not just to arm them, but to train them uh, so that they can provide important functions uh, in Iraq. Uh, as individual tribal elements, but also, very importantly, in conjunction with the Iraqi security forces as they continue to move into the attack more aggressively. So we will not directly arm the uh, tribes. We may provide the equipment, may provide the ammunition, but we'll do that in conjunction to the Iraqi government, and they will do it. We will help, but we will not directly arm the Iraqi tribes. Thank you for your question. Next question will be from Ned Hi, how are you? Um, yeah, good morning. Good morning. Um, just wanted to, just speaking with um, different uh, U.S. soldiers and my colleagues and I, and some of them have said that it would help to have forward, you know, operating advisors on the ground to call in air strikes, and that, that would lead to um, a more efficient fight. And even Iraqi, so Iraqi soldiers will say there's Iraqi tribes saying in Anbar, um, and that sometimes the message comes too late. Abu Nimr, in October, who you know many of them were killed as a primary example of that. So we're just curious about why this isn't happening. Are there plans for it to happen? Thank you. I, I think the chairman has uh, answered this question. Uh, at this juncture, there uh, there are no uh, forward air controllers uh, accompanying Iraqi formations. But the chairman has been clear that uh, when he uh, has determined that it is appropriate, he'll make the recommendation in that regard. I'd leave that for the chairman ultimately to make that recommendation should he desire it to, to occur. Okay. The next question from Mr. Shifrin Zahir Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Well, we are, we are going to constantly uh, look at the strategy that we're pursuing uh, with respect to our support to Iraq. Uh, and as the operational environment continues to mature over time, uh, we will, as we would always do, we would adjust that strategy so that it, was, it best fits the operational environment and is most effective in supporting both our operational goals, but very importantly, our, the goals of the Iraqi security forces. Uh, in its strategy. So uh, the general making the comment uh, that we'll constantly be looking at that strategy is in fact correct. Uh, 
the differences between how the strategy is ultimately uh, composed and ultimately how it is uh, applied on the ground. Uh, the strategy today is sound. Uh, it is accomplishing the objectives that we seek for it to uh, produce. But uh, I assure you that, uh, as we always do, we constantly look at the strategy to ensure that it uh, fits the operational environment. Uh, with regard to uh, dealing with the ex improvised explosive devices, IEDs and mines, that's, uh, that is a concern uh, of ours. I know it's a concern of the Iraqi security forces. Many of their casualties, in fact, uh, come from IEDs, as they're called. And so a part of the training that we intend to pursue will be ultimately uh, to provide uh, support both in terms of training explosive ordnance disposal uh, soldiers within the Iraqi security forces, but more broadly to give the uh, Iraqi troops the capabilities of dealing with uh, IEDs as they encounter them. Um, and I think that's uh, represented by the fact the United States has just given 250 what we call MRAPs, which are armored vehicles specifically engineered uh, to protect troops from the explos explosive effects of IEDs. So it, it will be a function of our training. It will be a function of our providing equipment to the troops themselves in their formations. It will be a function of our providing armored protected mobility uh, so that they can uh, move as quickly as they can and be the least susceptible to the effects of IEDs. Question this morning comes from Jane Allen, Associate Thanks so much, um, Jane Allen, today. General Allen, thank you so much. Good morning. In a lot of senses, this story is in Mosul, and although it's moved on, I wonder if you could tell us what needs to happen to have things in place to take back Mosul, and is it still as important as it was? And if I could reach back just a little bit, if we look at the early history of this, the Marines in particular in Anbar, I had a lot of trouble with Al Qaeda. The U.S. military was never really able to eradicate them. Why are you confident that now you can defeat a much more formidable enemy? Thank you. Uh, to review what happened in Al Anbar, uh, because I was there, uh, it was the partnership uh, of the Marines with the Iraqi security forces, and very importantly, the partnership with the tribes which ultimately brought about the defeat of al-Qaeda in, uh, in Al-Anbar. And as you recall, that then spread across Iraq. Uh, so in many respects, uh, what we're hoping to do today is to work through the Iraqi security forces, both those that are effective in the field today and those that are being <coughs> reconstituted uh, through the various training sites that have been established uh, in Iraq uh, to uh, bring to fruition the training of of 12 brigades, three in the north, nine in the south, uh, and with advising and assisting these formations with continual training, refitting, and equipping these formations, uh, we expect that uh, we'll see the effectiveness uh, of this force improve over time and ultimately that they'll be able to take back uh, the population centers and the municipalities. It's important that it be done uh, in the right measures. It's important that we have all of the pieces in place when that time comes. Uh, it's important that it's done in a deliberate manner so that the planning is, uh, is in fact uh, accomplished in the kinds of detail necessary and it's done in conjunction with the support that we have for the, from the coalition. Uh, but it's also not just a military matter. Uh, there are going to be some humanitarian assistance uh, considerations that will be uh, necessary for us to consider. Uh, as that uh, effort by Iraqi security forces to retake the country unfolds, uh, I, as you certainly will understand and know, uh, we'll have to provide relief to the population. There will be requirements for reconstruction. And so all of this has to be planned in detail. Uh, my visit over the last couple of days uh, left me confident that uh, that process is being thought of and is being planned. One of the messages that I carry uh, from this visit back to the coalition, uh, and we'll be meeting in relatively shortly uh, this month to talk about how we can better support uh, Iraq and the Iraqi people and future operations, uh, will be such things as how we can marshal humanitarian assistance to follow directly behind uh, the efforts of the Iraqi security forces so that we can, in fact, rescue the people from what they have uh, had to suffer uh, at the hands of Daesh. 
to include internally displaced people, refugees, and so on. So it's a comprehensive planning requirement that's necessary. Uh, and as I implied with the earliest part of my question, it's, it's not just about the coalition. It's not just about the Iraqi security forces. It's about the, the, the totality of the coalition and the entire Iraqi population, including the tribes, partnering with the security forces to achieve the effect that we seek. What's the question on Mosul? When? No, I won't actually, but go ahead. Sure. So in particular, what do you need to do to be able to be in a position to have a chance of taking back Mosul? It doesn't have to happen with, we have to take Iraq or near the Syrian border. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think we need to get into the, the operations. Um, but it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's not easy, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you have to generate the forces. Uh, by estimating the enemy's uh, posture and the enemy's capabilities, you have to generate the forces that will give you the tactical advantage when the time comes to begin the operation. Uh, before that operation begins, there are probably some operations that you'll want to undertake uh, that we call shaping operations, which sets the conditions for success. Uh, that, both the shaping operations and the actual military operations with respect to Mosul, would need to be very closely coordinated uh, with uh, the coalition uh, so that our capabilities are brought to bear at exactly the right time and in exactly the right proportions to uh, provide the greatest uh, confidence and capability for success to the Iraqi security forces. But it's not just the, the army, again, there are police considerations because once the security activities have occurred, then you have stability. Uh, activities that must occur and that's where the population now will be protected in the aftermath of the clearing operation from the resurgence of criminal elements or uh, elements uh, of Daesh that may seek to get back inside the population so there will be a need for a police presence that moves quickly behind the assault echelons that clears uh, Mosul. Uh, then the reestablishment of local governance will be important to tie very quickly that critical city that iconic city of Iraq to tie the governance of the people back into the central government. And then, of course, as I said, uh, an immediate infusion of humanitarian assistance uh, for the population with very serious consideration uh, for reconstruction. <clears throat> In there uh, is the reestablishment of electricity and fresh water, uh, some infrastructure uh, protection and infrastructure restoration. All of those things have to be planned together in a comprehensive package that is both timed and sequenced to, to achieve the effect that we want to achieve uh, in Mosul. And, and of course, must be uh, planned in a comprehensive manner with the capabilities that we and the coalition can bring to bear for the Iraqis. So it is not insignificant, uh, but uh, my sense is, as I leave Baghdad, that the size uh, of the uh, requirement and the components of the requirement are known to those who must plan it, and the, that process is moving forward. Thank you. Very good question. And I want to thank you this morning for your time and to see you, good friends, and I wish you the best. Thanks very much.